So good morning. Good morning. So as you're aware, um, the next witness uh, to give evidence was going to be um, Stephanie Riley. Yes. Uh, but she has found the prospect of doing so simply too much. So with your leave, sir, I'll, I'll be reading this morning a summary of her evidence. Yes, please do that now. So this is a summary of the um, statement of uh, Ms. Stephanie Riley. Stephanie has been a hard-working woman since the age of 16. Stephanie became the postmistress of the post office in Hedden Hall, which is in Sunderland, on the 27th of November 2009. Stephanie had problems with the Horizon system from the word go. She would call the helpline two or three times a week about shortfalls and balancing. On occasions, the shortfall would increase as a result of the advice from the helpline. Stephanie estimates that she paid or the post office deducted in excess of 15,000 to 20,000 pounds in relation to alleged shortfalls. Stephanie says there was not a month that went by where I was not putting money in. Stephanie asked repeatedly for assistance from the post office. None was, forth none was forthcoming. And her area manager said it would be like looking for a needle in a haystack. Stephanie felt bullied and intimidated by her area manager. She was made to cry in front of customers. Stephanie requested a further audit and asked Dave Brown, an auditor, if they could audit some historical documents relating to her branch. Stephanie was told that the post office records did not go back that far. Mr. Brown and Stephanie found a transaction that seemed like a duplication and needed to be reversed back to Chesterfield. Stephanie was very happy as she thought that this as she thought that if this duplication had been found, then she would find the rest. However, the following day, Ms. Lax dismissed this duplication over the phone and told Stephanie that the money had obviously been stolen and that Mr. Brown had not said to her that there was a duplication. Ms. Lax told Stephanie that the money had to be paid back or the post office would start legal, legal proceedings against her. Stephanie agreed to the post office taking £800 a month out of her wages as she was scared of being prosecuted. Stephanie had to borrow money off her husband to keep the post office afloat. Paying £800 a month for nearly a year nearly broke Stephanie financially and emotionally. Stephanie says, I should not have had to beg for help from the post office. It was easy for them to say it was my fault and that I should deal with it. Eventually, Stephanie had a breakdown and turned to alcohol to cope with the losses. As the shortfalls got larger, the more Stephanie turned to drink. She had to hire a manager at her own expense to run the post office on her behalf as she no longer felt able to carry out her role. Stephanie went to rehab for eight months and when she came out of rehab, she was terrified to run the post office. It took Stephanie 12 months after rehab to walk back through the post office door because she had lost all confidence in herself and was frightened the shortfalls would happen again. Stephanie feels deeply aggrieved, not just at her losses, but for the manner in which she was treated by the post office, effectively as a thief. She asked for help and the post office would not give it. Stephanie feels she was pushed to one side by the post office and that the post office's attitude was, you owe us that money, get it paid regardless of the consequences. Stephanie says she lost everything about her. She lost her identity and her confidence. Stephanie is now financially out of pocket and her marital home was repossessed. Stephanie's mental health deteriorated rapidly. She was given antidepressants by her GP, but they did not work. Stephanie's customers talked about her. And there was gossip around the local community, and the phrase plunky, a local term for alcoholic, was used by the community about her. Stephanie's son begged her to stop drinking. She had to spend eight months away from her son while she was in rehab, which is time she'll never get back. 
Stephanie's 22-year marriage broke up as her husband blamed her, as he said it was obviously her causing the post office shortfalls. Stephanie's mum aged overnight because she was worried about her daughter due to her alcoholism and problems she was experiencing with the post office. Stephanie said in her statement, I love the post office job, dealing with customers, getting to know them all. That is what gets us postmasters through. We postmasters do it because we love it and dealing with community. Sir, Stephanie has asked in addition that I read the following comments to you. Dear Chair, please accept my apologies for not attending today. Like everyone else who has attended and is to attend, I wanted to personally speak about my awful experience to both you and the inquiry team. Unfortunately, on Wednesday morning at 6 a.m., I had what I, had what I can only describe as a complete meltdown. The fear and anxiety of reliving everything again hit me square on and brought me to my knees. As my evidence states, due to the problems I had with the post office and the Horizon system, I ended up in rehab for alcohol addiction. For six years, I fought a daily battle to remain in recovery, but the thought of reliving this experience was too much to bear. In working with my recovery program, I'm aware of my limitations and had to make the decision to stay in what I can only describe as my safe zone and to, remo and to remove myself from the situation. My main focus in giving evidence to the inquiry was to highlight the injustice that was brought upon us by those at post office and to ask if we, the 555 litigants, will ever receive the money back that was stolen from us and ever see the day where justice is served. I again apologize for not having the strength to attend, but I hope myself and others who have suffered horrifically at the hands of post office are dealt with with the compassion and empathy we truly deserve. Thank you, Mrs. Dean. Uh, good morning, sir. Good morning. Uh, can I call Tracy Falstead, please? Yeah. Declare and affirm that the evidence I shall give that the evidence I shall give shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. Nothing but the truth. Good morning, Miss Elstead. Good morning. Uh, if you keep your voice up, um, you'll see that sometimes the microphones really do pick up what you say and broadcast it around the room. So just use that as your um, your test to make sure you're being heard, OK? OK, thank you. Can you give us your full name, please? Yeah, it's Miss Tracy Ann Margaret Felsted. OK, and um, how old are you now? I'm 39 years old. And I think you've got um, some children, is that right? I do, I have three boys. Three boys, and how old are they? Um, one's nearly 18, one's 15 and one's 11. OK. Now on the um, table in front of you, there should be a witness statement. Yes. Is, is that right? Yes. And is it in your name? Yes. And uh, is it dated the 15th of February at the top? Yes, it is. And if you go to the last page, can you see um, your signature, an electronic signature, I think? Yes. And, and is that your electronic signature? And uh, when you made the statement, were the contents of it true to the best of your knowledge and belief? Yes. Thank you very much. Now, I'm going to ask you um, some questions about before you joined the post office. Yes. Um, what did you do before you joined the post office? I went to school. Okay. And so um, what age did you leave school? I left school at 16. Um, and then I stayed at home for a bit yeah. um, with my parents. And then I moved to London, back to London, um, with family. Um, I didn't like the area that I lived in with my parents. I was up north. Um, so I moved back to London with family, um, and yeah, 
then I got a job at the post office. Okay, and which post office did you get a job at? Uh, Camberwell Green. Okay, and what kind of um, post office was that? Uh, it was a Crown Branch. And just um, explain to those of us that are not um, completely all over the detail what a Crown Branch is. So there were um, a number of counters. Um, it was run by a manager um, and the manager had a number of staff under her. Okay, and how big was uh, the Camberwell Green branch? Um, it was quite big, fairly big. Um, it, I think there were, from what I can remember, about 12 counters. A dozen maybe. desks, yeah. Yeah, there were quite a few. And so how old were you when you first started working? Um, I was 18. Uh, your first job? It was my first job, yes. And I think your formal title was counter clerk, is that right? Yes, that's correct. And so, did you get any training from the post office before you became a counter clerk? I did. When I first started, I was in the back office, um, first of all, just doing sort of dockets that got sent out. Um, and then I had a few days training um, with the post office to actually go on to the counter. Okay. And was that in branch training? No, it was, um, it was at, a different, at a different branch um, from what I can remember. Um, it was, I think I went to Hearn Hill, so I actually went out to a different, to a different branch to do that training. And did that training include training in the use of the Horizon system? Yes, it did. And how long did that last, the uh, Horizon training? Um, it was only a few days, to my knowledge. And can you remember how effective it was, the training? It, it wasn't in-depth. Um, it was general training on how to use the system. Um, and how to serve the public. Okay, and did it equip you to use the system and, and serve the public? Yes. And so you went back to um, the, the branch and started working? Yes. And what was that like? What was work like? Um, everybody seemed friendly. Um, I was the youngest there, um, so I had a, a kind of felt that everybody above me was sort of babying me, just, you know, looking after me, taking me under their wing. Um, everybody seemed nice. Um, but it was quite relaxed. It wasn't... Um, there was a few things I'd noticed um, that I didn't agree with, things that were happening. Um, but other than that, it was, it was fine. And did there come a time when you noticed um, some problems, some shortfalls? Yeah. There were um, a few times where I'd noticed some shortfalls, where I'd, I'd had some shortfalls on my till. Um, it was brought to my branch manager's attention. Um, at that stage, I was told to balance the till, and then um, they would rectify themselves. Um, and it was just, they were minor. They weren't anything drastic. And so how long um, after you started um, was the first shortfall that you noticed? Off the top of my head, I can't honestly remember that. From okay. So you joined in 2001, is that right? Yes. Yes, that would... Uh, no, 2000... I can't honestly remember, can't remember. the dates. Okay. No, the dates... The, the, I can't remember the dates right. off the top of my head. And so um, you noticed shortfalls. Um, were they very much money to start with? Um, no, there were a few hundred pound um, here and there. Um, there wasn't anything drastic until, obviously, we'd noticed, well, when I was away, they'd noticed the, the large amounts. Um, in an account that I think you've given to uh, Mr Wallace that we see in his book, um, it, it said that um, one day you found yourself with a small deficit and um, that your manager was not in the least bit concerned with no, it. No, no, there, there, um, there was never any concern by anybody, you were made to feel that, you know, it was OK, it, it was OK, it would rectify itself. And after that first shortfall, were there any more immediately or did things go back to normal? Um, I can't remember exactly the de the, how long it was. Yes. But there were, there was a time when there were other shortfalls, um, whether it'd be, it'd show up in the stamps, it'd show up in car tax, um, things like that so um, there were a couple of times but again you approach your branch manager you explain what the problem is you're told that it'll be rectified 
the um, book suggests that you noticed a, another spate of um, discrepancies with um, cash uh, adding up at the end of the week to a £1,300 loss. Do you yeah. remember that instance? Yeah. yeah, that was, again, I'd given it to the branch manager and actually told them, you know, said what had happened, um, spoke to them about it, and they said it'll rectify itself. It suggested that the branch manager took over the terminal when that happened. Yes. And what do you, when you told Mr Wallace that, what did you mean by that? They so took the, over the terminal. So basically the branch manager would go on um, under my name, under my number, and she would cash up the till. And did they do that on this occasion, the yes. £1,300 incident? Yes. And did the £1,300 still show as a, a shortfall after she had taken over no, the, the terminal? No, the till then balanced. Sorry, it balanced, did it? OK. And so I think there, um, there came a time when a much larger shortfall was noticed, yes. some um, £11,500 £11, odd. Yes. Can you tell us what happened immediately before then? Were you in the branch or not? No, I was not. And wh where, where had you gone? I was on holiday with my family. Um, I'd come back from holiday um, and... I was immediately, um, the branch manager came to me and said there, there'd been a shortfall in my till that somebody else had used um, and that it needed to be rectified. Um, I needed to have a look at it. So as requested by the manager, I'd gone in and cashed that, um, cashed up the till to find that, that um, £11,503.28 pence discrepancy yes. myself. And so you, what was said to you was shown by your own work to be true? There was that discrepancy? Yeah, yeah. And what did you think when um, such a large sum of, sum of money was shown was as missing? totally baffled. I couldn't understand where that had come from. I couldn't explain where that, that discrepancy was. Um, again, it was very relaxed. The branch manager said, you know, it, we'll sort it out. It's not a problem. Um, we'll find out. And I was allowed to go back on the till um, to carry on. We'd balanced the till and we carried on. But did uh, a couple of weeks later something um, uh, different happen to cause matters to take a, a different course? Yes. So um, I'd, I'd come into work um, and I'd been, again, I'd got everything out ready to start the day. Um, I'd been pulled to one side by the manager and said that um, somebody was coming in to interview me today um, about the discrepancy, which was absolutely fine. Um, I had two guys come in and question me. Um, they asked at the time whether I needed legal representation. Um, I declined. I had nothing to hide. Um, and it kind of escalated from there. And so these two guys, where were they from? Um, they were the post office investigators. Okay. Were they local or did they come from... I can't honestly... You don't know? No, I can't honestly remember. I, I just, you know, can't remember that. And what did they ask you and what did you say? Um, they asked me um, where the money had gone, what I'd done with the money. Um, never at any stage was it what do you think has happened? Was there any reason for this to happen? Um, it was very much, I was being asked constantly, what have I done with the money? Where has the money gone? I was being accused from day dot. And what did you say? There wasn't much I could say, apart from that I don't know where the money's gone. I don't have the money. What, how do you explain something if you don't understand it yourself? And did something else then happen um, uh, involving the post office a little while after the interview with the two post office employees? Yeah, so then um, I was put on leave. I was asked um, to leave the post office. I was suspended um, while there was um, further investigation, I was told, um, taking place. Um, and then it was a few weeks after... Um, it was, I can't even remember the time, really early in the morning. Um, 
I was staying at my mother-in-law's um, and the door, I wasn't actually there, um, but I had a call. I'd, I'd gone out early that day um, with some friends and the post office investigators were at my mother-in-law's door with two police officers um, to take me to um, the pl local police station to interview me. Which was Peckham, I think, wasn't it? Yes, Peckham Police Station, yes. And were you taken to Peckham Police Station? Um, they, I wasn't there at the time, but I, I gladly went to Peckham Police Station um, of my own accord. Um, and at this stage, I then asked for legal representation um, because obviously going to a police station is, you know, I thought this is serious now. It had escalated. It, it had, yeah, very quickly. And can you remember, um, were you interviewed at the police station? I was. I don't think you were arrested, were you? No, I weren't, no. You, you were interviewed under caution voluntarily? Yes. I was interviewed. Um, the police had nothing to do with this. Um, I was interviewed by the same two investigating officers from the post office. And by the same two, you mean the ones from the ones from, from the previous interview, yes. What was the interview like? It was horrendous. Um, the only way I could explain it is that I felt bullied... Um, there was no... I was a young girl. I was in a police station. I couldn't... I couldn't justify what where this money had gone because I didn't know where the money had gone. I couldn't explain anything. Um, and you, I was just constantly being asked, did you pay for your family to go on holiday? What did you spend the money on? Um, and it, it just kept going. And then in the end, my... my solicitor um, said just say no comment because they're not asking questions they're just interrogating me when the court of appeal came to look at the matter all those years later in april 2021 in its judgment the court of appeal records that your um, record of interview says that you were asked questions including can you demonstrate how you did not steal the money Yes. Do you remember those kind of questions? Yes. And you were asked whether you could satisfy the officers that you didn't have responsibility for the £11,000 that was said to be missing? Yes. And so you were being asked to prove how you had not committed a crime? Yes. Is that how the interview went? Yes. Yes, very much so. Um, they had access to my bank accounts... Um, they had access to my home. They never, ever came to my home um, or searched my home. But they, they, they looked for all the bank accounts. Um, there was no money to find because there was no money there. You said they were interested in the holiday. That, that was, I think, your parents' 15th yes. wedding anniversary. Yes, it was. And it was a family holiday to yes. the Dominican Republic, is that yes. right? But they asked you questions about that? Yes, they, well, they, they didn't ask me questions. They, they accused me of of paying for everybody to go. Um, but that wasn't, that wasn't correct. If, they, if they'd have looked into that, they would have seen that everybody paid their own for their own holiday. Were you... Um, did your suspension continue? Yes, and then I was, um, I was sacked by the post office and then prosecuted. And can you remember the offences for which you were prosecuted? Yes, I can. And what were they? Um, two counts of false accounting and theft. And um, did something happen when you were charged with those concerning your health? Yes. No, do you mind me asking about it? No, it's fine. You, um, you tell us what happened. I tried to kill myself. Was that because you'd been charged with a criminal offence you hadn't committed? Yes, it was. I couldn't defend myself. I couldn't... I couldn't explain what had happened. How many times did you try? Twice. Was that through taking overdoses? Yes, it was.
You weren't um, successful in your attempts? No. Was there a consequence of that, though, in terms of what care you had to receive? Yeah, I wasn't trusted by by my family to be left alone. Um, it had a it had a huge impact on on everything. To be fair, I'd missed um, I'd missed a family, a really close family friend. Um, sorry, a really close friend's wedding. Um, I had to go to the church, and then in the evening. If I hadn't have gone to, um, my family had sectioned me. So were you admitted to a secure psychiatric facility? Yes, I was. Was that the unit at the Princess Royal Hospital in Bromley? Yes, it was. And how long were you kept I can't in remember. the secure unit? I can't remember. It was, it was a... I don't know whether it was a few days or a week. I can't honestly remember. But it... it it wasn't pleasant. Were you given um, psychotherapy treatment? Yes, I was, and a lot of medication. Before this, had you been on medication? I had been on medication um, for um, low mood, anxiety, um, and just the, the whole general um, process that I'd gone through. Um, but yeah, um, the medication started to to be upped. So that was GP progress. prescribed medication before yes. the suicide attempts, and then um, it was upped when you were in the secure facility. Yes. Yeah. Did the treatment that you received, in particular the psychotherapy, eventually work? Enough to get you out. Yeah, enough to get me enough to get me home. Um, but again, I was you know my family watched. Um, but we were still going through this cycle of prosecution from the post office at this stage. And so um, you had to attend the magistrate's court, is that right? Yes, I did. And did you plead guilty or not guilty? Not guilty. And was the case sent off to the Kingston Crown Court? Yes, it was. And uh, what happened at the trial? Um, at the trial, I tried to defend myself as much as I possibly could. Um, it was very much from day one that the post office were adamant that I'd taken the money. Um, and there was no... You weren't given an opportunity to explain or even try and explain how something could have gone wrong. Or you you just had no idea. Um, um, I remember... well. It, it actually, um, since our convictions were overturned mm -hmm. last year, um, a forensic accountant um, actually got in touch um, who was actually hired at my trial to come um, to give a forensic account of my case at the, at the court. He was never called up. Um, but he came forward last year to say that actually when... He had some disquiet about my case at that time. He sat in a room with Fujitsu and the post office and had asked for certain documentation to be provided. He was then told that that would cost £20,000. Um, it would cost about. who £20,000? It would cost us, me, um, my legal team, £20,000 to get that documentation. Um, we would have to pay the post office and Fujitsu to get that to get that documentation and that wasn't possible that that only came to light to me um that was only brought to my attention last year when when mr turner came forward what was his full name uh, michael turner um can you remember why he wasn't called at your trial no um he he said that he was very surprised when he heard that um from the evidence that that was submitted that i'd been found guilty what was your defence? There wasn't much of a defence. I didn't steal the money. Um, it was... How can you prove that, you know, that you haven't stolen anything, but at the same time I hadn't been investigated as to where there was any money? No money was found. At that stage, 
was there any examination of the way the horizon system worked in the course of your trial? No. Did you know at that stage that there was a potential issue with the reliability of how the horizon system worked? No. And was there any evidence called about how the horizon system worked in your trial? No. I think you were found guilty by a, um, a majority. Yes. And were you sentenced immediately or um, was it put off to another day? Um, no, I was um, allowed home and I was to be sentenced after a psychiatric report. And was a psychiatric report or reports prepared? Um, it hadn't been repaired. It hadn't been prepared. Um, we went to the magistrate's court for sentencing, um, and the judge then asked again for that to be done. So, so the Crown was, Court or the magistrate? It was um, Guildford Magistrates Court, I think it was, or, um, to for sentencing. Right. Um, and then two weeks later, we had to go back again. Um, okay. And that's when I was sentenced. Did you know that you were going to be sent to prison? I had an idea. Um, I was told by my legal team that it was a possibility. Um, but at the same time, um, my family had been told that if they were to pay the £11,500 back to the post office, that um, I wouldn't get a custodial sentence. And so what happened in the period between being convicted and sentenced, so far as the £11,500 so was concerned? My family paid the £11,500, um, and it was we, we're not from a family of money, um, so it was paid from a number of family members clubbing together. And what, did that include your, I think, then fiancé? Yes. Um, well, not my fiancé, it was, it was my, a... um, my mother-in-law. Ah, um, I see. My grandmother, my uncle, um, my parents um, had to club together to get the £11,500 to pay the post office, um, which they paid, um, which I was really angry about. Um, why, why were you angry? Because I hadn't stolen any money. So why am I paying something that I haven't stolen? But they paid the money and it was handed over to the post office and accepted? It was, and then... The day of sentencing, the judge accused me of stealing from old age pensioners. Um, Was this in the judge's sentencing remarks? Yes, when... yes. Um, I'd stolen from old age pensioners um, and that because I showed no remorse, I wouldn't say sorry. I was sentenced to six months in prison. Were you asked to apologise? Yes, and I refused to apologise for something I hadn't done. Were you um, escorted from court in handcuffs? I was. Where were you taken? I was taken down to the holding cells. Um, and I was actually placed in a room downstairs. And then um, I was allowed to see my barrister. That was it. Um, who brought a note down from my family. And then I was taken to Holloway Prison. This may sound like a, um, a really odd question. What was Holloway Prison like? your worst nightmare it was horrible it wasn't a place for a young girl just remind us how old you were 90 I was a teenager why was it horrible <sighs> because I shouldn't have been there I hadn't done anything wrong there were things that I saw, I experienced, that nobody should go through. I think one of your um, duties was to deliver hot drinks 
around the wings. Is that right? Yes. And was there an occasion where you saw something particularly horrific? <laughs> yes, there was. I saw a young girl hanging in the cell. Okay, and this may seem like a really odd question. How did the experience of, I think, three months in Holloway you, you spent in the end affect your mental health? It hasn't stopped. I have intense therapy to try and get over what I've been through to deal with the stresses, the feelings, the flashbacks the dreams, the nightmares. In the 20 odd years since your release, has it continued, i.e. being accused of a crime, convicted of a crime that you didn't commit and being sent to prison for six months, continue to affect your mental health? Yes, it has. And I think it will always affect me. <laughs> Can you help us about some other effects, if any, that it's had on you? Did, did there come a time when you moved house? I moved um, when my first son was born. Um, I'd not, well, I, I'd come out of prison and my son had been, I couldn't get a job. And then my, I'd got a job. Just to stop um, there, sorry to sorry. interrupt your flow. It's OK. Um, did the conviction that you had for offences of dishonesty affect your ability to get a job? Yes, definitely. Um, Again, it's really obvious, but why? Yeah, no, I used to have to sign on. I used to... Um, obviously, I was when I came out of Holloway, I was on TAG um, for three months. Um, so I had a large TAG around my ankle. So you had an ankle bracelet yes. for an electronic TAG? Yes, I did. Um, and I was on a curfew from 7 till 7. So I was allowed out from seven in the morning till seven in the evening. Um, but when I went to sign on, um, because I had no job, um, I'd just come out of prison. Um, nobody wants to employ you. You've, you've got a criminal record and you've got a tag on your leg. Um, you've been accused of false accounting and theft. Nobody wants to employ you. So did you um, struggle to get employment? I did um, when I first came out. Um, and then I found that every time I went for a job, I had, to, I had to explain why I had a criminal record and what this was doing on here. And every time I had to explain my side of the story. And were you still saying you were innocent? Yes, because I was innocent. And... If the people got to know me um, and take a chance on me, then they would know the kind of person that I am. And quite a few people did. There were companies that didn't and turned me away. Um, but there were companies that, that did um, believe what I was saying and actually look at it and think, this girl hasn't done anything. How could she possibly... Did you get to work eventually? Eventually, but it's still... It was still the stigma of having a criminal record and people knew. So then you're anxious of stuff that you do. Um, I worked in a shop. Um, I worked in um, mother care. Um, I used to have a weekend job in mother care um, when the children were growing up. But I would never cash up the teal um, because I was afraid. I would never... And if I had to cash up the teal, I'd make sure that somebody was stood there with me to check what I was doing and to, to double-check that, you know, nothing was wrong because I was so paranoid and scared that something would go wrong. And I, I couldn't feel like that again. I couldn't be put through that again. I've taken you down a little side route. We were talking about moving house. Yeah. 
Why did you move house? Um, I moved house to get away from the stigma and the just people knowing, people being horrible. Um, I just wanted a fresh start mm. where nobody knew me. Where did you move? Um, I moved to Buckinghamshire um, with my fiancé at the time and my firstborn son. Um, and nobody knew. No, Nobody knew what I'd been through. Nobody knew that I'd been to prison. Um, I never, I never divulged anything to anybody. And so did you live um, in Buckinghamshire, a life that was largely free of the, what had happened back in, in London? For a bit. And then what happened? And then um, I went on holiday with my family um, and I remember my dad phoning me one night saying, y you, need to, you need to investigate this. I've just seen something on the TV um, with Lord Arbuthnot um, saying that, you know, there's a problem with the post office system. Um, at that stage, I was, I was abroad. And I remember getting up in the morning and we had no Wi-Fi access where we were. Um, so we, we literally went and got Wi-Fi access um, in a local, near a local CAF to, to investigate this. And then from then on, it came to light that um, from when we were told before that, you know, this doesn't happen all the time in the post office. Um, you've stolen the money, actually a lot of people had come forward and you weren't the only one. Was that the first time that you knew about um, other people um, having problems with yeah, it was the, the first, post office in this way? It was the first time that I knew that other people had been accused mm. um, of a crime they hadn't committed by the same company. And so what did you do as a result? Um, at that stage, when I got home, um, the first thing I did was I got in touch with my previous um, solicitors that I had at the time of my trial, um, trying to get any documentation that I possibly could from them, um, which I found very difficult because it, was, it had been so long. Um, I Do you remember when this was, roughly? Um, it, 2000, maybe 2014, 2015. Okay. Um, and then that's when I, I found out that there was a group, the JFSA, um, and obviously then I joined the group and went, went along to the meetings, um, and it escalated from there. Okay. And what did you do with the JFSA? Um, with the JFSA, we, we had meetings, I spoke, um, you know... It, I was really surprised at the time of how many people had been through the same thing. Um, our stories were very, very similar. Um, the, the process of how things were done um, was very, very similar. And then at that stage, um, I then obviously knew that there was going to be, um, you know, that I had to tell, well, at that stage, I had to tell my children because I, I had posts coming through the door from JFSA, posts coming through um, from the mediation scheme that I'd I'd obviously been, well, I'd asked to be part of. Um, and I was. Just, just hold, hold that thought. Yeah, We're going to come back to the mediation scheme in a moment. Yeah, no, that's fine. You said that you had to tell your children. Do I take from that that you hadn't told them that. I hadn't told anybody where I lived. Nobody knew. Um, I got worried that my children would go to school and that they would be picked on, that, you know, their mum was classed as a criminal, that I had a criminal record and I'd been to prison. So um, I made sure that it came from me. I had to tell them. I didn't want anybody else to, to tell them what had happened. Back to the mediation scheme. Um, tell us about how that came um, about. So um, I don't really remember too much about the mediation scheme apart from that I'd put the application through um, to go through the mediation scheme. 
Um, and then I received a letter back from Sir Anthony Hooper mm -hmm. um, to say that um, my case wasn't being taken through through the mediation scheme. Um, Did and you that, explain why? Um, it, I, don't, I don't remember. Um, I may have the letter somewhere. Um, all my solicitors may have the letter, but I can't honestly remember why. Um, but it, it just it, said that it wasn't my case wasn't had been rejected for the mediation scheme. In um, Mr. Wallace's book, it describes this as feeling like a a yet further insult. Definitely. Um, I just didn't know how... The only way to explain it is you just don't know how to defend yourself. How, how can you... Um, you know, you're trying everything still to that day. I was still pleading my innocence. Um, but it... To me, it just seemed like the, the, the mediation scheme was pointless and they weren't going to listen to anybody. Did this have any effect on your um, health, I, this new incident? Yes. Um, obviously, it, I'd learnt to kind of bury everything and live with the fact that I had a criminal record, which in an area that I lived in, nobody knew at the time. Um, so it's like, like suppression? Yeah. It, 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 literally, I, I, I just buried everything. Um, feelings. I never spoke about prison. I never spoke about anything. Um, so this was opening a can of worms for me um, it was opening up all those feelings and those memories again and so did it cause a deterioration in your mental health again um, yeah it did um, I was back on tablets um, and then um, I'd got married in 2008 um, and then 2015 um I got divorced, um, and that I'm not saying that 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 wholly that the post office are to blame for that, um, because they're not. But it had an impact on my mental health and the way I I saw things and the way I reacted. Um, it had an impact on my marriage then. So winding forwards to 2021, your um, conviction was quashed by the Court of Appeal on two grounds. Looking back over that 20-year period between conviction, which I think was in June 20, uh, 2002, to April 2021, that nearly 20-year period of your life, what was it like to live it? It was horrible. In the space of 20 minutes, I had three judges saying that 20 years of my life basically was erased. It was for nothing. I'd gone through everything f for nothing. I was a child. What would you like to happen now? I'd like to, for somebody to be held accountable. It's not just one person. There's not just one person that knew what was going on here. Somebody needs to be held accountable. I want them to sit here and feel what we feel. We're having to to do this again. We're having to tell our stories over and over. Do they have children? How would they feel if it was their daughter? My 15 year old son said to me last week that he's glad that he doesn't have the same surname as me. He's so good. He sits in school and he's, you know, they t he hears people talking. He sees stuff in his school. They have TVs um, that project the news. He's happy that he doesn't have the same surname as me. I 
Ms. Felsen, I've asked you lots of questions. Is there anything that you want to say to the chair of the inquiry that we haven't looked at so far? No, we just need we just need answers, just so we can move on with our lives. Uh, thank you very much for giving your evidence um, to the chair today. So I don't know whether you have any questions of Ms. Felsted. No, I don't. I don't have any questions, Ms. Felsted. But I just do want to say one or two things to you. Uh, as is obvious, you are one of the people whose story is perhaps better known than some of your colleagues. And it might therefore have been tempting for you to say, well, people know about me, I don't want to engage with this inquiry. But I'm so grateful that you have. To hear it pro directly from you is extremely important. So thank you. Thank you. So thank you. I wonder whether we uh, might take a, um, a 10 minute break now. Uh, so just whilst we uh, reorganize um, and uh, get Ms. Misra ready to give evidence. Of course, yeah. Thank you very much, sir. So may I um, call uh, Mrs. Seema Misra, please? Yes, of course. <coughs> Could you repeat after me, please? I do solemnly. I do solemnly. Sincerely and truly. Sincerely and truly. Declare and affirm. Declare and affirm. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Misra, can you please tell us your um, full name? Seema Misra. And how old are you now? 46. I think in front of you there should be um, a witness statement in your name, is that right? Correct. And um, is it dated the 17th of February this year? It is, yeah. And if you look at the last page of it, do you see your signature? Yes. And are the contents of it true to the best of your knowledge and belief? Yeah, this year. No, I think you're married, is that right? Yes. And is your um, husband with you? Yes. Today. And what's your husband's name? Devinder Misra. And do you have children? Two kids. And how old are they? 21 and 10. Okay. Now, I think there came a time when you joined the post office, is that right? Can you remember when that was? Yes, 2005. And what did you do before you joined the post office? Since year 2000, me and my husband have been running various businesses. So we had a shop before, uh, which was doing very well. And whereabouts was that shop? It was in Luton. In Caddington, I think, is uh, that Caddington, right? Caddington, yeah. A, a village outside Luton. Correct, yeah. Luton, between Luton and Dunstable, yeah. yeah. Okay. And um, that wasn't a post office? No, no, no. It was just a shop floor. And so how did it come about that you started to um, work for the post office? Me and my husband always been business-minded, so we had a shop, we'd done really well, we, it was like a first retail outlet we did, and we said like, yeah, definitely it's a, it's a good, good business to be in, and we had a, quite a good equity in the business, we wanted to expand, as like normally business people do. So we were looking around for an opportunity to, exp you know, like to expand for the bigger shop front and everything. So that's how we came across this West Pipe Free Shop and the Post Office opportunity. Can I just ask you to slow down? A yep. <laughs> I know there's a lot that you want to say, and there's a lot I want to ask you. Everybody says, yeah, that's fine. Um, but obviously the chairman is listening from Wales, and somebody's got to transcribe this afterwards. Sure. Um, so let's just slow it down a bit. Yeah. Okay. So I think you said a West Byfleet post Correct. office. Um, where's West Byfleet? In Surrey. Okay, and how did it come about that you're sort of north of um, Watford, one moment in Luton, and now you're looking in West Byfleet. How did that come about? Oh, well, we came from India, and here it doesn't matter where, where our the opportunity is. So, like, we, we moved, we lived in central London, then the opportunity came in Caddington, we moved there, then we saw an opportunity in West Byfleet. It was advertised in one of the paper or something, I can't remember, it was an ad, ad, advertisement we saw. And what kind of post office was the West Byfleet post office? Very busy, three county post office. And did it have a shop with it? Yes, massive shop, like a supermarket. Okay. 
And when you um, took over the post office, what was your role in it? I was the postmistress. So you were on the documents as the postmistress? Correct. And what was your husband's role? He's managing shop. And who else worked in the branch? We had, uh, we had a staff which we took over from the previous postmaster as well. And how many staff were there? There were like a one person and then we had um, employed two more. So three other than you yeah. and Mr. Misra? Correct, yeah. And did you and your husband have to invest money in the business in order to take it over? Correct. We had a huge equity. I think it was like 109 or 107,000 from our previous business. Which the, we the Caddington one? In Caddington one, which yep. we invested into uh, in the uh, West Pie Fleet. We had, a, we had a house in London, which was buy to let as well. And you said you had a house in London... And what, did you invest some of the equity of no. that in the post office? No, 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 no. We had, like, before coming to the post office, our portfolio was very big. So we had a house in London, a flat in London, which was buy to let, always been buy to let. Uh, we invested money in the post office and a shop and no loans, no nothing. And did you, did you have to take a mortgage out as well? Yes. I, I think I read somewhere that there was a £67,000 mortgage. Correct, yes. And so what was the total investment to take over the post office? It was well over 200. It was around about 200 something. And then the stock on top, it was well over 200. And it? by that, um, 200,000 pounds? Correct. You mean? Okay. Yes. And what were the benefits, as you saw them, of taking over a post office? We saw the shop front uh, because me and Dave, uh, they went always be, be running shop before and we saw it's a profitable business and we saw suddenly like yeah definitely we can do quite a lot take the taking up and everything and the post office being a center of community it was really good that you know it's like serving community we always believe in running charities and everything and we saw wow working through a post office we'll be we'll get a chance to serve community i think there was a salary as well of it, is, it was yeah. sixty thousand pounds is that right yeah, to start with, when I took over, it was just under 60,000. By then, I took it up to nearly 80. Okay. And was that something winding forward a number of years that you lost? Yes. When you first started to work in the post office, was the Horizon system already in use? Yes, it was. Had you um, ever used Horizon before you arrived in 2005 at West Byfleet? Uh, no, in March 2005, I was given, uh, I had a training. And then in June, I took over the post office. I did ask that I had my training in March. And there's like a gap in like when you're buying and selling, there can be like a delays. So I did ask, is it OK? Because it's three month gap. Uh, since I had my training and going into the branch. They said, no, no, it will be fine. You will have two trainers. OK. And where was the training? It was somewhere in London. It was like, uh, I can't remember exactly, but it, I, I was coming by from Luton by train to London somewhere. OK. So it wasn't in the branch? It wasn't in the branch, no. And how long did that training last? It was two weeks. Two, it was supposed to be two, full, uh, two weeks full day, but, by, but you, you normally used to finish by lunch. And did that relate to all aspects of running a post office? No, it was mostly cross-selling. So if somebody coming for like a car, te uh, like a DVLA, how can we promote the extra products and everything? If somebody doing recorded delivery, how can we tell them benefit of a special delivery and all that? And um, did the training include training on using the Horizon system? <clears throat> Probably just... Uh, can't remember, probably just a basic, like, like a stamps and all that, but no, it wasn't like a proper, proper one. Did you get any um, on-site training back at the post office after you took it over yes. on Horizon? Yes. Uh, well, uh, on, not training, training, so the uh, trainer were there, so just watching us, what we do and everything and all that. And did something happen when you were having that on-site training? Yeah, very first day, uh, when uh, 29th of June 2005, when I took over, that was the first day. But the first running day, I'm pretty sure it was 30th of June. And I had a trainer, Junaid, was there. And who's Junaid? My trainer. Yeah. 
And he was there. He introduced himself before we even opened the post office. And uh, we running the counters. He was there. It, uh, Everything was just standing behind. And in the evening, he uh, like he's like, we need to cash up. I said, OK, that's fine. We cash up. And we were around about under 100 pounds. I think it was around about 80 pounds something, under 100 pounds short. And uh, I said, like, why there's a shortfall? And his exact wording, oh, you just had an audit yesterday. It's never penny to penny. And I was thinking, I had an experience of running a shop. I, I worked in city, and I said, why wouldn't we penny to penny? And he said, no, we have to make sure that tills are good. So he said, like, you know, I have to put my own money from the shop floor or from my own personal money to back into the post office till, which I did. And so had the trainer been watching you conduct transactions? Yeah. And despite that, there was a shortfall being shown? Yes. And so what was done about that? So I went to the shop floor, got, my, uh, got cash from the till, and put it in the post office till. So you made it up from money from the yes. shop side? Yes. Uh, what did the trainer say about that? Nothing. He said to me, because his, his excuse was like, after audit is never penny to penny. That was his excuse. Did there come a time when the trainer rang the helpline? Yes, yeah, so the first week trainer, he was, he, he was there, but like when the shortfalls were there and everything, he said, oh, and on Wednesday when you do rollover, it will balance up. And on Wednesday when I do rollover, I have to put again money from the shop counter. And he was just gone, nothing, nothing said. But then when the next trainer came, Michael, second, second week, and uh, he asked me, congratulations, how is it going and everything. I said, you know, I told him what been happening from the first day till the balancing. He was concerned. He said, oh, that shouldn't happen. He was concerned. He said, okay, let's see how it goes. And he was there like Junaid, but he was paying more attention to each and every transaction we do and everything. And uh, on Wednesday, he was there with the balancing and all that. And there, there was a shortfall. It was in hundreds, you know, I think a couple of hundreds pounds. And he called the helpline, said he'd been here whole week watching each and every transaction, be doing it correctly, but still there's a shortfall. So the helpline asked him to do some procedure on the system, and the figure doubled up. Just um, tell us that last bit again. He, he was getting some instructions down the phone line, on the phone line from yes. the helpline. Correct. They said to do something with Correct. the system. Correct. And that caused the shortfall to double. Doubled. And so what happened with the double shortfall? Nothing. He said, like, you know, just keep an eye. He, uh, I still can't, I can't remember exactly how was, it de how was it dealt with. But he said, keep an eye. If there's any issues, there's a helpline number. Call them up. And, but he was shocked. I said, I can't. I asked him, can he, can he stay over another week or something? He said, he can't. He's supposed to be here only one week only. And so after that, did the shortfalls continue? It continued, and um, I've been told uh, by the helpline that, you know, there'll be transaction error, correction will come up, then you can take your money out. Uh, but in the meantime, it's my responsibility to make sure tills are good. It's mean that they should balance. Just winding forwards, we know that you were um, taken to court. Correct. Can you remember whether there were any documents available about what you've just described, i.e. two trainers coming in for a week each, watching you work, as you said, each and every transaction, and there's still being shortfalls, and then the second trainer, Michael, doing something by reference to the helpline and it causing the shortfall to double. In, during my trial 2010, post office denied that Michael ever been to my post office. They couldn't find uh, Tomiko Springer, my, my, my branch manager, area manager. She couldn't get hold of because I've been telling her that I'm having shortfall. They couldn't get hold of any of them. Michael, they completely denied. But later on, I think it was 2013 or 2014, we found out from our post office internal memo that Michael been to my post office. And... You mentioned in your statement um, something which you call a so-called audit. Yeah. Um, why do you call it a so-called audit? It's just, 
they, I don't know if they're like, I, I, if I take you back in 2005, when I was screaming for help, uh, by, uh, within a couple of months, I told my area manager, I can't run post office like that. I said, I'm losing money. I bought a business to make money, not to lose money. And she said to, that's the Tomiko Spring I'm speaking about. And she said, okay, let me speak to my manager, Angela. And then she came back, same day she came back, called me is to, okay, we'll get the audit done. I said, do whatever need doing, but I want to get this sorted. And uh, they said, okay, I asked them when they will be coming. They say, hey, we can't tell any dates because it's gonna be surprised. And uh, then um, after, I think within a matter of weeks or something, uh, auditor came in. I, I was so happy, I welcomed them in. One of them said, oh wow, you're very happy to see auditor. I said, yeah, well, <laughs> you know, I want to get this thing sorted. And uh, they made, uh, they said they done the audit and they made another shortfall. Despite of me putting in money regularly, they made a shortfall of around just under 4,000 pound. Just hold that thought. Yeah. Winding back, had there been continuous shortfalls from the beginning until now? Correct. And had you been making up the money from takings in the shop? Yes. Yes. Go back to where you were, the audit that was going to be a surprise, and you welcomed it. Yes, I welcomed them in, and I was so happy that they, it will be all sorted and everything. But they were done in a good couple of hours, and uh, they told me there's a shortfall of, uh, I don't know the exact figure, but it was under four, just under £4,000. And uh, they asked me how I'm going to pay that. I said, no, I want to know where the money is going. going. Why are we losing money? And he said, I need to make a phone call. Then he made a phone call to Elaine Ridge and uh, my area contract manager. And uh, she said, oh, well, thankfully, they agreed to take this time. They, they agreed to take it out of my salary. But any, they're like a, how I describe them? They're like a, uh, it's a so-called audit. They call them auditor, but like, like a bouncer, you see them. They're like very big. And I'm tall as well. They're like a bigger than look down on you big and they, said, they gave me he gave me warning that particular auditor gave me warning he said mrs mishra any time you were 500 pound short we'll take the post office away and that was it did they take money from your salary they did yeah so technically i was still under six months of my probation period so paying money in and then they deduct money from my salary as well and did this continue, either deductions or you making up the balance? Uh, yeah, there were like, uh, there hardly any transaction correction came in my favour. Rest, they were like uh, against me, even like later on, there was like a £20,000 for the National Lottery and all that as well. They took it out of my salary. Did there come a time when you were accused of stealing £74,000 odd? Yes, 80000 actually. Oh, okay. It was 14th of January when the auditor came in. So that's not the figure that ended up on the indictment, is it? No. It was the day I was told it's 80,000. So tell us about um, uh, that in January. So the auditor came in. I told them there will be a shortfall. They asked me to write it down, and uh, they did the audit. They said it's, it's really shortfall. They called somebody else as well. Investigation team, I think, they called as well. They interviewed me. They asked me if I want anybody here. So, like, I was, I've got nothing to hide, so it will be all sorted. I haven't done, I haven't done anything, so it will be all fine. So they took me, interviewed me. The figure they've been saying eighty thousand. But in the meantime, they asked me if it's okay for a locum to come over and run the post office. I said yes, please, because otherwise it's so. It's not village, village, but it's not town either, West by Fleet. So otherwise, I say, like, the pensioners will have to go to the next town to get the money and all that. So it's, locum can come and run. That's perfectly fine. Um, and when we came down, so basically we have around about 3,000 square, square foot shop and then three counter post office in the end and the same space on the first floor as well. So they interviewed me on the first floor. When we came down... They said to me, Mrs. Mishra, congratulations. Uh, the locum just take over, took over the post office and he's 2,000 pound over. And I said to locum, can you please find the rest of the money as well? So from there, 80 to 78 for how come it gone to 74? You don't know. I don't know. 
when you were interviewed under caution, did you try to explain what had happened? Yeah, that time it's just like they made me after my first audit and after going through the individual tills and everything, they made me feel Elaine Rich was the one who told me, oh, Mrs. Mishra, there's you know some wording they have like a like a haunting you like it's like that. Mrs. Mishra, we have so many of the post office, they're doing fine. It's just your post office you're having issue with. They made me feel that I'm the dumbest person. I don't know I don't know how to add one plus one. And uh, my confidence was like a rock bottom. I've, in the meantime, we caught some stuff like stealing money. We got rid of them, but still there was like money missing and all that. I did tell them about the staff theft, but I said, I haven't taken a single penny. I told them in my, I haven't taken a single penny. Um, so in your interview, did you say that one explanation for the losses that you were being um, shown was staff theft. Correct. In, in interview, um, did you um, make any admissions yourself? Did you admit uh, to falsifying the figures for the cash on hand and currency awaiting collection? Yeah, definitely, because I was in complete mess. I didn't know what to do. So there came the point I wasn't even looking how much figure they should have. If system said you should have X amount of money, I said, yes, we have. X amount of stock, yes, we have. And the the false accounting they picked up, they opened the folder. So you're trying to say this figure on that day wasn't correct? I said, yeah, it's not correct. Not even that, knowing the date and all. I said, okay, this figure, they just picked the figures up. And yeah, I said, yeah, that's not correct. And so you made some admissions in interviews? Correct, yeah. Okay. And were you eventually charged with an offence of um, theft and six offences of false accounting? Yeah, in December 2008. Now, I think you pleaded guilty to the false accounting charges. Yes, because I knew the money is not there, but I still accept it. So if, if you call that false accounting, yes, I did. Was a plea bargain ever discussed with you? No plea bargain, uh, but if I can take you a little bit back to the yes, please do. 2000, you know, when the auditor came in, they they asked me to have, if I want anybody here. I said no. I, I trusted, I trusted them. They will they will sort it out. And uh, then they took all the bank details and then they did the home search. They said, is it okay if we can search your home and all? They said, yep. Well, you know, go ahead, I've got nothing to hide. So they went over, there were quite a few people, I can't even remember the number of people, but there were quite a few. They went to kids' cupboard, moved the fridge, everywhere they, they'd been to the house and the search. Later on, I realized they was not supposed to because this is a, they didn't have any warrant or anything, but I was naive that I've got nothing to hide, so why should I stop them or all that? I gave them all the bank details, the inquiry about the property in London, I told them this was, our uh, property was bought in 2000, just day before my eldest son born. So five years before we even took over the post office, but these are the documents you take them. There wasn't plea bargain, but my, my first solicitor said to me, plea guilty. Plea guilty so you can have a lesser sentence. Plea guilty, what, to the theft and the false account? Correct, yeah. But you didn't plead guilty to the theft? No. Like, why should I plead guilty for the crime which I haven't done it? Was it ever explained to you by your lawyers or anyone else um, why, in your case, the post office went ahead with the theft charge, even though you had pleaded guilty to the false accounting charge? Later on, not in 2010, but later on, we, found, yeah, we, we do, did find some information. And what was that information? They knew week before my trial uh, there's an issue with the horizon, which they withheld. They knew uh, they, the way I felt it, that they wanted to set an example to others, that if you try to raise caution on horizon, this is what happened to you. Can you remember finding out anything subsequently about the availability of confiscation orders for theft charges, but not for false accounting charges as a motivation for proceeding with a theft charge? Or am I stretching your memory? 
um, a little bit. If you don't remember that, yeah. it's all right. We yeah. can yeah. we can yeah. deal with that um, yeah. with other witnesses on a on, on another occasion. Mm. The fact is, they went ahead with the theft charges. Yeah. Winding back to when you were operating the Horizon system, did you ever think that there was anything wrong with the system? Once the staff member mentioned that it happened with the previous sub postmaster, and he got the system checked, so I did raise that issue with Tomiko Springer. You raised it with? Tomiko Springer, my area manager. When it came to you being charged with these seven criminal offences, did you raise the issue of the reliability of the Horizon system with your lawyers? Not to start with, because I was under the impression I'm the only one. So it must be I've done something wrong or my staff has done something wrong. Just when my previous barrister said to me, plea guilty, and we refused, it was just night before my first trial. I think that's May 2009. Yeah. The first I'm trial, sorry, the one that got adjourned. Uh, yeah. Just that night before my trial, they find out there are other people as well. So just tell um, the chair about that. Yeah. You're listed for trial um, in... Um, May 2009, and you're saying the night before the trial, you found out that there were some other people um, who'd got an issue with the Horizon True. system. True. I remember that. It was just me and them, and they were so distressed. Like, it's just like, how can our barrister be saying to plead guilty? So he, he doesn't have a faith in us. How can he fight for us? It was just like, I was like, I can't be that mad that somebody asked me £10, I give him them £1,000 or £10,000. There must be, I don't know, like, how was it God willing or something? I, I went into Google and uh, it's like post office cash issues or something. I don't know what I've typed. And then there came the, another, uh, Jo Hamilton's case. Uh, she done, she done the witness already. And uh, I remember calling, I was like a 118, 118. I was just, I was so, oh my God, so is there somebody else as well? It happened. I uh, called her at the number. Luckily, it was late in the evening. She was still in the shop. So after speaking to her, I was just like, I was like, please help me, please help me. Did you apply um, through your lawyers at the um, commencement of the trial, which I think was at Guildford Crown Court, is that right? Correct, yes. For so an adjournment of the trial? Yes. And was that application successful? It was, yes. So the judge allowed an adjournment. And was that to allow the issue of the reliability, I'm calling it for the moment, <laughs> of the Horizon system to be examined? Correct. And uh, what happened after that? Was um, somebody instructed to act on your behalf yes. to um, explore that issue? True. And who was that? Uh, Mr Charles. Sorry, I can't pronounce his surname. McClacken. Correct. Okay. And um, was he a professor? Correct, yes. And do you remember what he was a professor in? IT. He's like, he's like a very big... I remember, like, qualification was really... You know, he was going pages and pages. Yeah. Okay. And so he was instructed on your behalf? Yes. And were you kept up to speed with what was going on, with what he was doing? Yes. Um, every time, the mostly we heard the trial date was adjourned... Because mm -hmm. uh, because the post office didn't supply the information and all that, it was adjourned quite a few times because they were not supplying the information. And I think in the end he produced six reports, Professor McClacken. He did, and there were still some issues need to be answered. And so, did there come a time when the case actually went to trial at Guildford Crown Court? Yes, on the day the trial actually began, there were still some issues outstanding. But then judge said uh, Garrett Chunkin from Fujistu was there as well, and so did Professor Charles were there as well. So he said, like, he can't, cannot drag in for longer. So he gave them some time to go into the, into the room so they can discuss with each other. Before the trial started, you mentioned that there were some disclosure issues. Correct. Uh, can you remember what any of those 
were. If you can't, it doesn't matter because we we yeah. know in the background what they what they were. Don't know the exact wording, but all I know, like it will be if it hasn't been produced, it it won't be a fair trial. So there was an application to stop the trial because documents hadn't been produced. Yeah. Yes. True. Yeah, and every time it's been adjourned as well. Okay. Quite a few times. But at your trial, the way that the Horizon system operated and its reliability was an issue. Correct. And you've explained that um, they were there. Um, who did you understand Gareth Jenkins to be? For just an expert. Did he give evidence? He did, yes. And Professor McClacken? He did, yes, as well. And what happened at the end of the trial? Jury came back with a word guilty. Did you give evidence in your own defence? I did give evidence as well. I did give evidence as well. And can you remember roughly what your defence was in your own evidence? I, yeah. What you said had happened. Yeah, exactly what I've told them. Like, hey, like from the day one, there was issues and everything, and I've been screaming for help. So you explained that there were some unexplained losses. Correct. And um, I think you also mentioned that there were some staff thefts too. Correct. Your case additionally involved a full-scale attack, a full frontal attack on the reliability of the Horizon system. Correct. Now, presumably now, all these years on, you don't remember the details of what each of the experts said. Not each of the experts, but I still remember the uh, Judge Stewart's wording. He said, there is no fact, no evidence that I've taken any money before they pass it on to the jury to decide. So he said that, and uh, still jury had to decide that if I'm guilty or not. Did you mention that you had reported your um, early losses, as shown on the system, to the help desk through the trainers? Yeah, through the trainers, like losses in the sense, like when the losses come, be reported and then make them good anyway. You told us that um, you made up some funds from the shop. Yes. Did you make up funds from any other source? Yeah, from water from family. As well. How much did you borrow from your family? Around about 20,000. I'm sorry? 20,000. 20, and was that um, from your sister in law? My sister in law, yeah. And so you'd borrowed 20,000 pounds from your sister in law and put that into the post office system? Correct, and so, sold our personal family jewellery as well. I think it was on the 11th of November 2010 that you were sentenced to 15 months imprisonment for the offence of theft and six months imprisonment on each of the false accounting charges to run concurrently. Is that right? Correct. And a confiscation order was made in the sum of £40,000 and you were ordered to pay compensation of £40,000 that was to be paid out of the confiscation order sum. Correct. How was that sum, the £40,000, in fact, um, paid off? I think it, don't think it was a paid off. They took a charge on the property in London. Yes. So they put it through auction. So you had this second property in London. Was that in Finsbury Park? Finsbury Park, yeah, three-bedroom flat, which was always been by to let. And the post office took a charge over it, sold it, and satisfied the confiscation order. I don't know how much they got, because yeah. there was a mortgage as well, because I cancelled the mortgage payment. I knew they got, they, I, because I was angry with the post office, I cancelled the mortgage payment as well. I didn't want it, like, but, uh, yeah. I don't know how much they got and all that, so yeah. But there was, I remember then going back to court again and saying that, you know, I think it was like a pound or something. There was, I don't know the legal terms, but it wasn't fully paid. But okay. they, they 
took the property to auction. Was that day the day of sentencing, the 11th of November 2010, in fact, a, a special day for you? Yes. In a different respect. Yeah, my elder son, 10th birthday. <clears throat> At that point, did you know that you were pregnant with your second son? Yes. On being sentenced, were you taken to prison or taken to somewhere else? Taken to hospital because I couldn't believe that I've been sent to the prison, sending to the prison for the crime I never committed. I didn't took any bags till the last minute, till the last minute I had a faith in the system that, you know, I won't be sent to prison. Why should I be sent to prison for the crime I never committed? So the probation officer did mention about the bags. I said, no, I, I have a faith. It will be all fine. It will be all fine. And when judge gave 15 month imprisonment, I didn't hear anything after that at all. All I felt sharp pain in my stomach. And uh, when I opened my eyes, I was in Guildford Hospital. How long did you stay in Guildford Hospital? Whole night and whole day. So I think it was the 12th evening, I was transferred to Bronzefield. You were transferred to? Bronzefield Prison. How long did you stay in prison? Just under four months. And when you were released from prison, I think you had to wear an electronic tag, is that right? Correct. What was your experience of prison like? Oh. Nightmare. I never thought I'm going to come out alive from there. I swear to God, if I hadn't been pregnant, I would have killed myself. That's for sure. Being in the prison for the crime I never committed, I was like, I brought a shame to my family. That was going through my head. And while in the prison, I had like, you know, people were self-harming them and all that. And I didn't trust the system anyway. I was like, anything is possible in this. If I can be sent to the prison for the crime I never committed, anybody might come and stab me because they're on something or, you know, anything is possible. And I might con get contaminate something from the fellow inmates or whatever. It was just like horrendous one, on one occasion because I was mistreated with the, by the police, uh, prison authorities. When I spoke to Dave about it, he got so angry and he threatened the prison authority, you know, if anything happened to my wife or my, my kid, he will come in front of the prison and commit suicide. And that was, oh my God. It was the most stressful. I still hope that it's just like a nightmare, but it's not. And all this time you were pregnant? Yes, pregnant for the baby we've been waiting for such a long time. And your 10-year-old son on the outside? Yep. Did he come to visit? Yes, but he didn't know it's, it's a prison. So we tell him because mummy is pregnant, so she's in a special hospital. We didn't know what to say to him. You were released, as I, uh, we've discussed, after four months on a tag. Uh, how long were you on the tag for? For another four months. And were you on a curfew? I was on the curfew, and they, because they told me that uh, I have to behave. If I do anything, they will bring me back in. And I was like, I'm not worried about that because I'm not going to go anywhere because... I didn't go out anywhere. Even I was scared to go to the shops, a supermarket. I said, like, just in case, if while I'm going out, an alarm goes, and they will think, oh, she is the one with the tag on, so she must be criminal. Let's put her back in. I didn't want to risk it. So I didn't go out. 
went to went in labor with a tag on. And I was thinking, oh my God, it's just like, what could be the midwife thinking? Like, what kind of mother I'm going to be? I've read that you were um, called something sort of nasty when um, at this stage. Is that right? Pregnant thief. The pregnant thief. Pregnant thief. So my picture was in the front of local newspaper, pregnant thief. The window gone been beaten up. He didn't, while I was in the prison, the window my husband been beaten up quite a few times because he's my husband, so locals beaten him up as well. And was that because of what those people said linked to, firstly, your race, and secondly, you having stolen money in their view? Yes, they said too, they like go back to your country and they use all that words. The words um, I've seen recorded as having been said to your husband were fucking packy coming to this country and stealing old people's money. Yeah. Is that right? Correct. Did you move house? Yes, we were like, I only came to know about when I came out of the prison. Dave didn't, never mentioned me while, while I was in there. So I only came to know, we were so worried about kids' safety that if they can do this to the vendor, then kids are very young. So we moved house. Did your conviction affect your ability to secure a job? Yes, I was, I was so, I didn't have any confidence. I couldn't work in office at my atmosphere. Like people would be talking about me because that's what whole village did. They stopped speaking to us and you lost friends. And uh, like if, when I, uh, in my view, everybody knew. Even if I'm working in the office, they say, oh, she's the thief. If something goes wrong, oh, she's, she, she's a convicted criminal, so she must have done something. So uh, being an IT background, I heard today, you know, let me just do, be an Uber driver. In that way, people might not know me and there's no cash handling, so I'm, I may be able to get that job because it was just on Dave's shoulder. He, is a, he, was, a, he was working. And even that application was refused. In between, because of my conviction, they couldn't have convicted criminal running an Uber taxi. In the meantime, I said, okay, because I didn't have the courage to go out and work with other people, I couldn't. I said, I, I did my child minding as well. I said, okay, so I can work from home and all that. Even that wasn't successful because I see in my local Facebook, all the people been asking for child minder, but nobody was coming to me because of my conviction. Did the conviction affect other areas of your life? <sighs> you know, I was thinking of a word or a feeling to describe that I couldn't I couldn't find I couldn't find that definitely in all over for nine years we had to hide the truth from our elder son we only told him 2019 when we won GLO that this is what happened because he was only 10 year old in the morning, mommy promising him, dropping him to school, that in the evening we will celebrate your birthday together, and in the evening I'm not here, and then if we find out I'm in the prison, just approaching teenager as well, and I didn't know what to do, so we have to hide the truth from him. And you revealed that to him in 2019? Correct. And what caused that? Sorry, was. What made you because make that decision? At, at least we had a one victory in, on black and white piece of paper that I'm not the only one, and I wasn't mad screaming for help. So it was proven in a high court, yes, there, 
horizon is not a robust system that we've been claiming. So I'm not, I knew I'm not criminal, but at least one of the big court decided as well, yet yeah, there was something wrong with the system, not with the people. Okay, so it was an a part of the outcome of the group litigation Correct. that prompted you to tell? Yes. Were you involved in the group litigation from the start? Yes, yes, very start. I remember in the beginning, it was only like five, ten of us, like ten people around the table and everything, and then from there to big group. Did you receive money? I did receive some money. Under the settlement agreement? Yes, I did receive some money. You told us that you um, lost the job. Yep with a salary that you built up to £80,000. Correct. That you um, invested £200,000 odd in the post office. Correct. That you had paid money in out of the shop takings to try to balance the books. Correct. That you had borrowed £20,000 from your sister-in-law. Correct. Did you get all of that back under the agreement? <laughs> no. And why not? They have their own ways of dealing with it and decide what they want to do, probably. Who's the they in that? Uh, Royal Mail and Post Office. Like, yeah, it was like, a, now it's separate, but yeah, Post Office. Do those financial consequences that I've just discussed, that loss of money, still affect you? It does. It does. It's still make me shiver when I think about it, the time we've gone through, the things we have to sacrifice. Did you take part in any um, other mediation or scheme? Yeah, my, uh, as far as I remember, my name was put forward for mediation, uh, but it was refused because of the, I have a conviction. More recently, have you um, sought to make a claim under the historical shortfall scheme, the HSS? I know, don't know the exact word, no, can't recall. Okay. Standing here now, sitting here now, looking back, what would you like to happen so far as the post office is concerned? I go, you know, I've been writing it down. I was like, I got lots of things. Definitely, it, it wasn't, it wasn't the, just the postmasters who suffered. It was the whole family. We personally had to sell our shop in neg negative equity. We lost our investment in London, which we... If you want to refer to something that you've, you've written down yeah. uh, to prompt your... Um, memory, yep. then please say so. I know that it's difficult to is, sometimes remember everything you want to say when it comes to this moment. True, and putting in the right words as well. It's, like it's just all there and just saying it. It is, it is difficult. Please, please do. Tevinda, my husband, became alcoholic because of what was going on. And I can still, still feel the frustration in him that he couldn't protect me from post office and he couldn't get justice for me yet. I still feel that frustration in him. That, I don't know how they're gonna cover that. And uh, while I was in the prison, my parents back home in India thought that, you know, uh, because I wasn't able to talk to them, they thought they might have harmed me. <laughs> So they were, harassing, they were harassing him, say like, you know, like, what have you done to our daughter? So they were like, he was getting pressure from my parents as well. So but I, I couldn't call them. So they, he did a, like a, not a conference call. So he, uh, he called my dad and then he put the phone next to his life because I was, I was allowed to call him. So we set a time that I will call at that time. So he called dad, and that's how we got to talk, and that calmed my parents down. So, but before he was thinking that you've been a good son-in-law, but what happened to him? So that pressure was there. I, can, I can't even imagine what he had to go through. Our 10-year-old son, he said, okay, it tell like he'd been, mommy gone, gone to prison, but when's she gonna come back? When's she gonna come back? 
while we, we, we lost the business, we set up a taxi firm. So while the trial was going on and everything, so I was the one taking calls, and then we had the vendor and the other drivers who was run, passing the job on to them. So when I was sent away, that business we had a losses in because there was nobody to take the call. And the vendor had to leave 10-year-old son at home, sometime at night as well, keep him on the video call and do the runs because he had to pay the bills. So sometime, I think like, you know, it was the... Eldest son kept Dave alive, and the youngest one kept me alive. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here. We wouldn't have been here. The things we have gone through. We've been, I had some health issue after having the eldest son. That's why I couldn't conceive, and there was like a huge gap. We've been waiting, including the eldest son, he'd been waiting to have a sibling. He always used to say, or um, that uh, my sister-in-law, like his, his elder son, uh, go sibling, and the, his, their brother go sons go sibling. I'm the only one. He been waiting. He been praying to God. I want a sibling. I want a sibling. And when the news came, we couldn't celebrate it as a family. We had to. We were happy, but at the same time, we were sad that we couldn't even hold each other's hand giving birth with a tag on. Even that time, the thought was like, in me, it was early morning birth. I said, oh my God, alarm will go, and they will come and get me from the hospital. I couldn't believe anybody. I know the solicitor said, it will be fine. We have informed them, but I couldn't say, no, anything is possible. If I can send to the prison for the crime I never committed, anything is possible in this country. I was worried about that. It didn't work till this date. Filing any any document or anything, you know, when they is, have a conviction column to take, that bring back the nightmares. Anything, it's just like anything, it is a small thing, it is like a basic thing, but not for me. So well, like on an insurance application? Anything, anything. Even though you now rightly tick no? Yes. Even when they say now there's more, now they say, you know, anything. In the eye of law, I was a committed criminal till 23rd of April 2021 anyway. Even now they say, it make any statement, make sure it's true, otherwise it'd be an offence. I say to, you know, I laugh about it now, but I say, please don't say that. I just came out of one conviction. <laughs> so, like, my hand shivers to sign. I was so scared when I came out. I mean, most of the people stopped talking to us anyway. When we moved house as well, when everybody used to ask me my name, I just used to say Seema. I'm proud of my name. I never, you know, it's like, I never said Seema Mr. I said, what if they Google it? Because it was, it was everywhere. For eight years, we didn't celebrate my youngest son's birthday because I was scared, you know? I didn't want them to get bullied at school. It was just like, I said, like, I'm, I'm blessed. I'm blessed to have a lovely family. I'm blessed to have the windows my husband and two beautiful kids. I'm blessed to have them. But, but I didn't want it word to know that I'm his wife or um, my kid's mother, because in me it was, I want to protect my kids. I, didn't, I did the late school runs, so nobody can see me. My eldest son played cricket. I used to take him to, when I started going out of bed, I used to drop him to matches. Never stepped into the ground, because I know, oh my God, He's doing so well in his life. I don't want it. My name attached to him, so people caution him. They I wanted to protect my kids. I just like used to park my car that way. But I can see him. I can be proud of him. I can see him playing, but I didn't want anybody else to see me. I lost my faith in the system completely. It was because of, I would say, Honorable Paul Marshall, Flora Page, Nick Gold, and Nick Wallace. They bought my 
faith back into the system. No, we will get justice for you. There came the point during my appeal when Mr. Marshall and Ms. Page had to step down. I was so scared. I was so scared. For me, it's just like post office or authorities like a mafia. I'm saying this because I wanted to say that, please don't send me warrant in my place, so saying that you say do everything. In my, in my view, they were like a mafia. Because of whatever happened, if Mr. Marshall and Ms. Page have to step down, they might get me killed. Swear to God, I was like, I was scared to go out that I might cross, I went across the road, post office would probably hire somebody and they might crush me. I was scared to drive that, you know, they might get me involved in an accident or so I never get to the court, like all that kind of things. I might be just making it up. That's how I, was, I felt. My eldest son studied university in London. I was like calling him, you know, like, when are you coming home, everything. Speak to me every hour, let me know where you are. I was so scared of everybody's safety that anything is possible. Anything is possible. There was a time because I couldn't work. Even for the essentials, we have to compromise. There was, like in, in, like in Asian cooking, we have like a different, different kind of lentils. They were like a, over 10 plus kind of lentils. If you buy a pack each, it will be expensive. So I used to buy one bigger one. And when kids used to ask, why are we having this one regularly now? They used to say, it's good for you. This one is more healthier. Because we couldn't afford the essential needs. Our growth were amazing before buying the post office. No loan, our cars were fully paid, everything before the post office, before 29th of June 2005. Our growth was stopped. Our golden, golden era is like a young couple that we couldn't enjoy. Precious time with the kids that we couldn't enjoy. I think you asked what I want from the post office. I did. Lots of things. I'm trying to try to, I will do my best to be polite. Wanted to ask them, you know, why on earth they played with the postmasters, not just postmasters, and their family's life. In my eyes, and everybody knows now, post office have blood on their hand. And I believe now, and I read it somewhere as well, that we live in a developed country. But how can we let all this criminal roaming around freely? You know? How can post office lied under oath in my trial? So did Gary Junkin from Fujusu. And when I lost my case, they celebrated. Why? Because they wanted to set an example to others. This I only found out later. They probably thought, you know, they can crush this Indian lady. I probably won't make a noise or say anything to anybody. And that, you know, nobody will know about it. But I'm afraid, I'm sorry to say that, they were wrong. My motto is to let everybody know, like who's suffering in the post office, that they are not the only one. That was a very difficult decision for us for to go in the media, to in the media. But I would like to let everybody know that was the reason, like they are not the only one, the other people as well. I wanted to let the true picture of post office know it to the other people as well. Are you referring there to the later discovery of a, a document which said that um, your case had involved an unprecedented attack on the integrity of the Horizon system. Correct, yeah, but back in... And, and that the prosecution team had managed to destroy it. Correct, yeah, but we only came to know that that's recently, even back in 20, 2011 when I came out, 
We you know like there are so many people suffering, but the one thing is lacking. There is no much, no, not many people know about it. Everybody been told that they are the only one. So I was like, even if I could say one life by going into the media, say like, this is what happened to me, I feel glad, I feel happy. That people need to know about it because it wasn't widely known. That's why been working, having a news agent for last nearly since 2003, even before buying the post office, we had a news agent store. We didn't knew about it. So I wanted to know, like, to go and tell everybody, hold on, be strong, you're not the only one. We will get through this. Yeah, sorry, I interrupted you. That's fine. And what come in my mind, as you probably have gathered, I've done my schooling in India, and I read there in India, it's probably the same everywhere, the democracy is the government for people and by the people. But in post office scandal, made me feel this is a land of two law. There's a separate law for the rich and in authority, and then there's a separate law for people in common people. Example, we have to get 46 million to bring the truth forward. Whereas, whereas like common people is restricted by law, they get penalized. Even like signing a council document, we have to make sure that it's a correct information, otherwise it will be an offense. Any document. Whereas authorities can lie under oath, no contempt of court. Like Gary Chunkin did in my court, my trial. He had an oath. He took an oath and lied under oath. Not, excuse me if I'm pronouncing the name correctly, Paul, Paul Wendella. Lie to parliament. Contempt of parliament. Big offense in my lie, and it should be big offense in democratic country, but nothing happened. Janelle Singh and whoever was the head of the post office legal department when my trial was going on, they deliberately hide the evidence from court, which could have proved me innocent, but they decided not to. Contempt of court. In the court, we ask for witnesses from po post office, like Michael, Tomiko. Post office denied Michael never been to the post office. I don't know what legal term will be for that. I don't know. They erased, they erased Michael call log. All these people, till date, they've been having fun time with a loved one. Well, where is my family and our fellow postmaster's family and themselves? We were having a challenges, health challenges, wealth, peace of mind, which proves that is a land of too low. At least it's proven till now, Gary Junkin in my trial, Janelle Singh, head of post office legal system, Paul, Paula Wendell are a criminal and it's black and white written down. Why are they still roaming around? And another thing he always bothered me. We knew, we th we've been told you're the only one, but authorities, judiciary system, police system must have noticed something. Why is there is suddenly rising postmasters being questioned and taken to judge? There must be some sort of like an information feed or something. You know, because they are part of establishment and they make, make each other happy, probably. That's why they're roaming around freely. At least, at least all the, not just like the people in my case named, at least the people who've been named so far and who's gonna be named later on, at least they should be arrested, get arrested get arrested and get questioned. Whereas like, you know, the like, fault of horizon system, we've been questioned. And here now we know two big courts, two big courts of the country said, you know, like they named, they named some people and they say like, they're like a criminal wandering around. I'm, I don't feel safe.
that we have a criminal wandering around in our streets like that. For a job application, mortgage, even to get a mobile contract, we common people have to go through credit checks, conviction checks, and lot more. Wherever, whoever involved in a court proceeding get CB, get titles, what kind of checks they do. I bet if, you know, like somebody been tied while going through court proceeding, they've been honored. If that happened in India, there will be lots of examples. People would have stepped down and shamed. They would have had shame on themselves, oh my God, I can't take, I can't take this honor. Whereas, a title might be wrong, chairman or who was Alex Crozier. It was Crozier, it was Alan, 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 Alan Crozier. Alan Crozier, <laughs> sorry. They were the people, the head of the post office when my trial was going on, when there was like a lost of horizon issues were going on. What are they doing now? Chair on, chairman of BT. So they don't have to go through all these checks and all that. It's just only for the common people. The people in the authorities, they can just, oh, we took you to court, you're a criminal, we ruined your life, but forget it. We're gonna make most of our money. We will have the, all these big, big articles. I took my post office salary from 50 to 80,000. But whose turnover got increased? Post office turnover got increased. You know? I've been awarded Crown of Colleague Award from post office. Because whatever happened in the evening by the balancing time, I didn't, left that ha I didn't let that happen during daytime by serving the people. I made sure we had like increasing the salary. They must have done, we must have done something good, better service. We changed like a uniform as well to so make sure like people feel welcomed and everything. It's a busy post office. We used to like have an extra sitting for the people as well to sit down and all that. We the one who took the help post office to get the turnover, but what did we get in return? Convictions. Do you know what I think? That all these people who made money, they might have retired now, they might have stepped down or whatever, but since the horizon issue started, not just in my case, I can say like whoever was involved in there. At least definitely the people who are named, they should be behind the bus straight away. Sometimes I wonder, what, do we wait, what are we waiting for? Are we waiting for them to, so they can run away? And then we say, oh my God, this is a different country law and all that, they, whatever. I don't know why, what are, we, what, what, what are we waiting for? Their money should be taken off them. Their houses should be put onto auction like they did mine. And their money should be distributed among five for five because looks like it, we're getting penalized. You know, like we normally say to kids, I normally say to kids as well, you know, like when the kids are growing up, we tell them, oh, tell me the truth. I won't, I won't, uh, I won't tell you off. That's what we normally do to the kids. Here, 555 five, five, taking them to the court and we're getting penalized for that. Oh my God, how can you do that? That's what I feel, that's what my feeling is. We're getting penalized for that, like to bringing the truth in front of everybody. On my, Guilford, on my trial in Guilford Crown Court, Judge Stewart said, there is no fact, no evidence that I've taken any money. But why then, when the judge believed that I haven't done anything, why the, we still have to wait for jury to, jury to decide? You know, big, two big courts of the country so far told post office, so many things, it, it looks told post office, it's a mass destruction on industrial estate, st industrial state. But they don't care. Hey, when I say they, means post office and authorities. They don't care. I clearly can see, you know, like they're probably thinking like, oh, give them a chance to run away or something, probably. <laughs> that's, that's what my feeling is. Why they're not still, people being taken to police station for the small amount. Here we're talking about millions and millions, so many lives. So many people are not here to be with us. And they're the one who lying freely. I definitely don't feel comfortable with my kids roaming around freely. I want to inquire to punish them. 
not let them to pass the blame. Oh, yes, I noticed that I passed it to that person, like, like that kind of stuff. And another thing, you know, like, I, I'm really thankful for the inquiry, you know, so we can put our point forward. But at the same time, I don't want post office to hide behind the inquiry and saying that, okay, we'll make a decision when the inquiry is done. <laughs> inquiry going to find out who know what and what, they, what punishment they like, they, but they don't, for whatever decision they need to, whatever question they need to answer, they can, they should still carry on. Till now, I told my story so many times. But again, when I still speak about it, bring out the nightmares back. It's just like all these sounds, everything, I can just feel it. Like it is it's just happened. It doesn't, yeah, I'm not convicted criminal anymore, but I don't think will I be, it's like a imp lifetime imprisonment. It's like a lifetime imprisonment for, for me and my family. I don't think we'll be able to, I would love to forget about it and move on, but I don't know how. Every time we go to court, we find a new evidence. Whether it be a clerk advice, shredding document, and there could be like so more coming up as well. But can they be sincere for once? And say the truth and accept it? And to be honest, I say that for myself and probably the same for everybody, not just physically, we are mentally tired. We are mentally tired. We wanted to enjoy life, whatever we go left. Can't just like, it's not easy thing. But that doesn't mean we're gonna give up. We do want the answer. I just say, please get this sorted. Uh, thank you very much, um, Mrs. Mitsura. There are all the questions that I ask of you. Um, Chair, have you got any questions that you wish to ask of Mrs. Mitsura? No, no, thank you, Mr. Beer. But as with the last witness, I'd like just to say a few words. Mrs. Misra, you are right, of course, that you have told your story on a number of occasions to a number of different people. And I was fully aware of most of what you had said uh, this morning. Uh, and I have been aware of it for, well, virtually for the whole time that I've been involved in this inquiry. But all that said, there's no substitution for me hearing it directly from you. And just by way of an example, who could have actually understood the impact, not just upon you, but your husband and your children, without listening carefully to what you have said this morning and now into this afternoon? So thank you very much for coming to give evidence to this inquiry. I appreciate it very much. Thank you, uh, Chair. So I wonder whether um, it might be appropriate to take the lunch break now. We're um, in your hands at this end and um, uh, come back no, at 1.30. Uh, uh, um, I, th I think one of the disadvantages of remote hearings, Mr. Beer, is that you are much better placed to judge whether or not we should take our break now, and I will fit in with everyone's arrangements. Um, I, I'm never one to refuse a meal. Um, <laughs> Uh, so can we say 1.30? Certainly. I'll see you all then again. Thank you.